today. My hope is that by the end of this sermon, so, you know, 25 minutes, half an hour, I will convince you to stop inviting people to church. That's my goal. Over the next 25 minutes, half an hour, to convince you to stop inviting people to church. How are we doing, Harold? You're not going to take me off of the stage? Does it sound super boomy to anybody else? Is that just me back here? Or is because I've got a different perspective. Okay, never mind. If it's cool for you, it's cool for me. <clears throat> uh, okay, so... You, okay, we, we understand what we're doing. I want to start with a preface, and that is I want to talk about invitation specifically. So if I want to convince you to stop, or, or if you have never done it before, to, to not uh, want to invite someone to church. Uh, what does it mean to be invited? I was having a chat just this morning. Uh, with a, I think, four-year-old who was super excited to tell me that he had been invited to a party at Bounce. And he was as excited about the invitation as he was about the party. In fact, because he, he was kept going on about the invitation, I'm like, wow, it's amazing that you're going on about this invitation when I'm talking about... I didn't try to tell him this, uh, preaching about being invited today. <clears throat> um, but uh, I wonder if you've ever been overlooked, actually. If there was something that you're really hoping for or a party that you heard about but your invitation never came or someone that your friend's with gets married and other people start RSVPing and you keep waiting, or did, I, did they have my updated address? Maybe there's an issue. Maybe uh, did I slight them in some kind of way? Maybe you've been uninvited. I know for sure uh, over the kind of 70 or so weddings that we've had at Cedar Light, Sometimes uh, they've had to change venues and the venue capacity has diminished in the second venue and people have had to be uninvited. That would be a, that'd be a tough, I don't know if you've, I don't know why I'm smiling. This is a really kind of <laughs> devastating life kind of circumstances. <clears throat> or have ever been, I have, been picked last for a team, like in the playground or uh, at school where they well, let's just pick two people uh, as like team captains and then they have to go through and then there's only two people left and you're like, oh my goodness, it's going to happen. I'm going to be the very last person chosen. Or, or have you ever tried to break into a clicky community where you just keep trying to get in and then you keep initiating conversations and they never come back? sucks, right? It, it, is, it is heartbreaking, heart-wrenching to be overlooked in this kind of way. It's not even really rejected. It's sometimes worse than rejected. It's being ignored. People haven't even considered you. On the flip side, you have being invited uh, when you are the first person picked for a team or you weren't expected to be invited to a party or invited to a wedding and you get an invitation and think, wow, I must... I must be meaningful to this person. I might, they actually have considered me. In fact, they are spending money on me and time and effort and energy. Or someone, um, <clears throat> maybe you've got a, a job. You're going for a job and someone said, yeah, come and work for us. You're invited to come and work for us. Or someone says, come over for dinner. Come over for lunch after church. Or come, we're, we, you know, we're all going down to the beach. You should come too. It's really exciting and uplifting and life-giving to be invited. Maybe uh, someone once said to you, will you go out with me? Or you said it to somebody and just the anticipation of, I really hope that this, this comes off and then it does. Or maybe, or will you marry me even? It's an invitation to share my life or you've been invited to share someone's life. Invitation is incredibly powerful. Invitation is being included. <clears throat> invitation is being welcomed. Invitation is the first step to belonging. Invitation is an opening. Invitation says, you are wanted. I recognize you. I acknowledge you. Uh, and, and even having seen you, I don't reject what I've seen. I want more of what I've seen. That's what an invitation does. It says all of those things, even though it doesn't necessarily say any of those things, it says all of those things all at the same time. In Proverbs, we looked at this uh, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> Proverbs 18 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and invitation 
is something incredibly powerful and life-giving. To use our words to invite people, especially, and in fact only, I would say, when it's backed up with congruent action and activity. So if you say, yeah, come and, come and be on my team, but then you have no intention of them being on your team, or you come over for dinner, but then you have no intention of actually having that person over for dinner, whatever it is. Um, that can be a bit, bit crushing, actually, where it's not backed up by congruent action, but where it is, that's incredibly life-giving. Jesus was inviting people all the time. All the time. Jesus invited people, uh, not just to him, but in, he invited them to lots of different things. He invited people into his rest. We see this in Matthew 11. He says, All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal to him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so Jesus, one of his invitations <clears throat> is to come to him, into his rest. In fact, he says, here, take what's mine onto you and I will take from you onto me. Your burdens, your heavy load, I'll take that from you. And here, you take from me my rest. He invites us into his rest. He invites over and over and over again. He invited people to follow him. Uh, Matthew 16, he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Follow me. Matthew 9, uh, as Jesus passed from there, he saw a, name, a man named Matthew. That's the guy writing the book, the letter, sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Matthew 4, he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus saying, follow me over and over and over again. Matthew 19, Jesus said to him, if you'll be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor. You have treasures in heaven, then come and follow me. Over and over and over again. Uh, John 10, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. Matthew 8, Jesus said to him, follow me, leave the dead to bury their own dead. John, 8, uh, John 12, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Come and be where I am. Jesus, again, over and over and over again, he's inviting people into his rest. <clears throat> he's inviting people to follow him, to be with him. Following Jesus is not just following his teaching and following his rules. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. That's, that's a part of it. Following Jesus means to go where he goes, to be where he is. To, to follow him around, follow his lead. Uh, another one of Jesus' invitations is not just to be beside him, but to be with him, actually union with him. John 8, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, if you will remain in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The letter John 15 famous passage. Jesus says, remain in me. He's inviting his followers, people who are with him, to not just be with him, but to be in him, united with him. He says, remain in me and I in you, just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. You are the branches. Remain in me. He's inviting people to rest, to swap our burdens for his peace. He's inviting us to come and live with him where he is, to follow him in the things that he's leading us into. And, but not just to follow him around, but actually he's inviting us into union with him, to be hid in him, to be united with the Holy One of Heaven. He goes on and he says, The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone doesn't remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire and they're burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love another invitation 
If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. The goal of his invitation is that we would be with him forever, that we would bring glory to God the Father and that we would be full of joy forever. That's an invitation. That is, that is, <clears throat> that is a life-giving invitation. I mean, literally life-giving giving invitation. Because God has invited us, he has also made us a people of invitation. As we're looking at City Light for this year, and again, I want, I want you to stop inviting people to church. Asterix. Uh, we are a people of invitation. God has invited us and he set us an example and he has given us a command and he's given us this mission to go and be inviters. So as we're looking at City Light for 2023, one of the kind of banners for the year is invitation, that we would be marked by our love for and from God and we'll be known as the people who invite. A number of years ago, <clears throat> way back towards the, like the beginning of City Light, 10, 10 or so years ago, we decided, uh, young and dumb as we were, we, our goal was to become the most welcoming church in Australia. So we talk about it all the time. This is our goal, become the most welcoming church in Australia. Uh, and of course, that's a kind of a, it's almost a naff thing, because how do you even measure that? And it's not really a competition. Um, but just so that we would set in front of us routinely this goal of welcome, of actually welcoming people to us and into our community and ultimately to God. We've got to be a people known for our invitation. Like Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, like God makes his appeal through us. As God welcomes and invites us, we are to in turn welcome and invite because that is God making his invitation through us. That's how God invites his people, is through his people. That's how he does it. Welcoming, <clears throat> welcoming is important. It's one thing. Uh, invitation needs to follow welcome. Welcome can just be a greeting, like, hello, it is genuinely really good to see you. Come on in. T to what? what, what are we, what's the next thing? The next thing is inviting them into a thing. Welcome is just a, you're over there, I'm here, but I want you to feel good about being here. That's welcome. That's step one. The next step is inviting them in. But into what? If we're meeting people here, the invitation could be as simple as come sit with me, like be in my, like, you know, I'm sitting here, this is my space for today, come and sit with me. You're welcome here, you're wanted here, you belong here. Or could be into my home, come to my house, come to my place. You're welcome, you belong, you're invited. I think the chief invitation is to echo God's invitation, which is welcome into my life. Come into my life. That's the hardest part of invitation. Is walk into my life. So Paul writes to the Philippian church. Says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose... I wonder what it could be. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. So if we <clears throat> want to live out this verse and apply it to our invitation, our welcome and invitation, this looks like laying down our preferences and picking up the preferences of someone else. So when I personally, me, walk into a room like this, any, any room like this, if it was a, um, a concert or a movie or even a church gathering like this or any kind of room like this, 
Uh, I am naturally quite introverted. And so my kind of uh, natural goal for myself is to kind of be a little distinct, discreet, atomistic, separate. I will go sit like down the very back, uh, away from people. If I see someone that I know that's comfortable, I, I might be very happy to see that person. Uh, in the natural, like in my flesh, um, that's kind of what I want to do. I want to I be away. So n- preferring my own needs, actually. Preferring my own or preferences, because my preference is uh, I've come here to watch the mus- musicians or uh, see my favourite band or watch this movie or whatever it is. But if I'm exampling after Jesus... If I'm an inviter, like he is an inviter, this isn't just a welcome, although that's very important. It's not a, it's not some sort of abstract invitation where just I'm handing out something to something. So come to church. That's what I'm trying to convince you to not do. The invitation that echoes after Christ's invitation is welcome to my life. Come into my life. I'm I'm interested in you. I'm invested in you. I care about you. I'm preferring your needs. I'm laying down my needs. Again, me in my natural, uh, introverted, lay that down. And I want to pick up your needs. And if you're extroverted, you want to lay down your needs as well, which might be to go around and see people and do all those kinds of things. And instead, uh, be invested, interested, welcoming, and but then also inviting. Not to fulfil our own needs, but to prefer the needs of the other. This looks like inviting people into our homes and our lives, inviting people into the family of God, inviting people into a new way of life, inviting people to consider their own way of life and to consider what Jesus has done for them. And it does look like inviting them to church, but when I say that, I don't mean inviting them to church as we would normally think about it, like, hey, come to my, get my church's gathering this Sunday because there'll be great music or the pastor's going to tell you about Jesus. But rather, we would invite people into our lives, into our, our own community. Uh, we've had lots of people become Christians at City Light over the last 10 years. Uh, into the hundreds of people become Christians. And genuinely, I can count on two hands the number of people who have like, made, a, made a decision, if you like, at a Sunday gathering. And a couple of years ago, we had, we'd have three gatherings a day. So that's a lot of gatherings. Uh, less than 10. Most of them have happened in people's homes, in discipleship groups, one-on-one in a cafe, down at the beach, in a car, in a drive, at an activity. Our goal is not to get people into this room. Our goal is to invite people into our lives. That's what Jesus did. Our hope is that they would eventually come and gather with the church, with the family. But this is a family gathering. This is primarily for the family of God. So that we can be built up, so that we can join together. We can lift up our hearts and our voices with one voice and worship our King. And people who aren't in our family are, inc- are absolutely welcome here. People who aren't Christians absolutely are welcome here. When we love it when we have people outside the family coming to our family gatherings. Love it. Um, but there has become a trend over the last probably 50 years. Oh, if I could just invite someone to church and let the professionals do the job, we'd get this person over the line. Uh, it doesn't work like that, actually. It's not the kind of invitation we're invited to. I get the vibe. Uh, back in the back when I was growing up, back in the like nineties, eighties, nineties, people used to talk about even even two thousands. People would talk about <clears throat> well, probably the chief reason people don't want to invite someone into their life is fear of rejection. And we kind of nod a lot and go, yep, fear of rejection, that's, that is the primary reason I don't want to invite someone into my life. I don't know if that's true, actually. I suspect the greatest reason people don't invite is what if they say yes? 
if I invite them over, I have to open up my life. If they say yes, it's going to cost me energy, emotional energy, mental energy, physical energy. It's going to cost me money probably in having them over and having another person uh, in my life whose needs I'm going to want to meet, whose burdens I'm going to need to bear. It's going to cost me my home. They're going to either, I'm going to have to spend more time cleaning my house or they're going to see my house as it really is day to day. It's going to cost me time, money, effort, energy, but open hearts, open homes. This is the invitation that Christ has made to us. Come and be with me. Remain in me. Join my family. And we are echoing his invitation and being obedient to his command when we invite others as well. <clears throat> again, I suspect some, some people will be, you know, have that fear of rejection. Uh, but again, I suspect the greater fear is if they say yes, it is very costly. But it is that exact thing to which we've been called. We want to be, we want to bear fruit, like Jesus said. Uh, where are we? If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you want, it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. It's not, he's not saying, go and bear a lot of fruit, <clears throat> prove to me that you're worth it, and then you'll be my disciple, and then you'll qualify. I don't know, he's saying, I, are you like me? Are you inviting like me? It is costly. Imagine what it cost, or consider, I should say, what it cost Jesus to invite us. It's costly. But that's what we're being invited into. We want to bear much fruit, and we can't bear fruit if we stop at welcome and don't go to invitation. One of the things that um, I shared this with our leaders uh, a couple of years ago, actually, <clears throat> uh, just to very briefly nerd out and then finish. Right. So in um, and if you are a greater nerd than me, and I butcher this explanation, please have grace for me. You know Wi-Fi, right? Wi-Fi? Yeah? Anyone not know Wi-Fi? One of the greatest of all time inventions? <laughs> Wi-Fi. It's how you can, one of the ways you can connect to the internet with your phone and not have to plug, plug in, not have to dial in like I did when I was a kid. Uh, back in the day, in fact, even probably still now, uh, one of the main ways that Wi-Fi works is you have, you know, your modem router or an access point and every device you want to connect to that access point connects to the one single access point. And if you have, if you have too many people trying to uh, access that access point, there's no more connections and nobody can get through. I remember, uh, I remember when Y2K was like the big fear. Uh, and uh, people were like, man, Y2K, everything's going to go down. It's going to be terrible. I was down at Victor Harbour. And uh, my mobile phone at midnight stopped working. And I thought, it's over. This, it actually happened, Y2K. But what actually happened was there were so many people trying to connect to the network, there were no more kind of places to actually access that point anymore. Uh, that's how Wi-Fi works. And we treat church like this. We go, okay, there's a pastor or a preacher or a home group leader, and if I can just get my friend to come and connect with that person, or if I can just connect with that person, that's going to be my Christian community. But that's how we connect with God, actually. Everybody connects directly to God through the Holy Spirit. How we are meant to operate is more like uh, how many newer Wi-Fi systems work, which is a mesh network where each router or node can connect to all of the other ones and lead to a greater coverage lead to many, many more people being able to connect. That's how we are to connect. Not everyone trying to connect just to one person in the church. We have our one person, that's Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. When it comes to invitation, it goes on to invite people into this room. We've got to stop inviting people to a Sunday gathering. Start inviting them to the church, which is the family of God, which means into your house. I mean, inviting people into my house. 
I was convicted of this this morning as we're pulling out, 7.30 uh, of our driveway this morning to come and set up. Our neighbour was pulling into his driveway after a night shift and Beck's like, man, it's amazing. Like, the, these people across the road who moved in a couple months ago, their hours are crazy and we haven't even really connected with them yet, apart from a wave and a hello. We've done the bare minimum of the welcome. But we've not yet done the invitation. But that's the costly thing we've been welcomed, we've been invited into. We are being invited into a life of welcome and invite. We've got to welcome and then we've got to lead the welcome to an invitation. Not an invitation to go to this paid professional minister whose job it is to equip us, or all of our leaders here, are here to equip all of us for the work of the ministry so that we would be great inviters, risking rejection for the greater risk is risking having to increase our capacity for love, increase our capacity for emotional output, increase our capacity for bearing burdens. Or if we're at maximum, we might need to get rid of some things like watching TV or recreation or things that aren't leading to bearing fruit. Recreation can lead to bear fruit, so don't, you know, it's a whole other sermon. Does this make sense? It's costly. We've got to do it. Inviting is being Christ-like. Inviting is the first step to belonging. Inviting is low-hanging fruit. If you have kids, your kids are probably better at it than you. This week, my kids have invited or asked, hey, can we have this person in our house? Can we have this person in our house? They get it. And so first, what do we do? We respond to Jesus' invitation. Then we be like Jesus and invite others into our life so that he can make his appeal through us. I mean, ultimately, we want to invite people to these gatherings, uh, but the, the greater invitation is to invite them into your life. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your invitation to us through Jesus by your Holy Spirit, uh, we are ill-deserving of that invitation and yet you have loved us, shown us great mercy and grace by inviting us into your family, into your kingdom and even into union with Jesus. And so thank you for gifting us the faith to respond to that invitation and give us the boldness, Father, to extend your invitation to others into our lives and as we invite them to respond to the same gospel, the same invitation that you extended to us. Lord, we're asking that we would see many come into your kingdom this year as we wave the banner of invitation uh, and help our community to be marked by welcome, marked by belonging, marked by inviting. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.